You want to make games, you're making your first game, you're wondering where is a good place to start. Here are five often overlooked genres for your first game. Mm. Hi everybody, I'm Christian from Lazy Devs Academy. I am a game designer, I teach game design. And a while ago I made a video about five bad genres for your first game. Uh, five genres that I see a lot of my students pick as their first game and they struggle and, and fail sometimes because of the genre they picked and um, Yeah, and so a lot of people ask me um, What are some good genres for your first game? And so this is that video. Hi, welcome straight to the point The most important goal to achieve when you're making your first game is to finish the game Period. A lot of newcomers aren't really aware of this, so let me spell it out as clearly as possible. The vast majority of games never get finished. Most games are abandoned somewhere midway because um, you know the um, developer um, underestimated the amount of work required. They got stuck on some technical issue. They lost interest. It took too too long time and they had to abandon the game. This is sadly something that you will continue to struggle with um, throughout most of your career as a game developer. It's kind of like a thing in game development, but it's especially the case for newcomers. And as newcomer is the biggest issue that will keep you from getting a foot into the door, just finishing your first game. So when you're picking a genre, a good genre for your first game, we want, this is something that we should focus on. This should be our goal. We want to pick a genre that maximizes our chances to get something out of the door. And yeah, at this point, inevitably somebody comes in and is like, okay, what about quality? I don't want to be working on some lazy dev. Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, here I come. Uh, Shovelware titles. Uh, I want to be making good games. Okay, so I, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but I kind of have to. Um, this is a question of um, prioritization and expectation, managing expectations. Obviously, obviously, this is a valid concern. We want to be working on something that we can be proud of, clearly. However, an unfinished game will always be tremendously disappointing, no matter what. No matter how much effort you put into it, if it's not finished, it's not going to be satisfying. Something we could do is make an analogy to a different kind of domain. So let's say you are a painter and you're painting your very first painting. Obviously, obviously your first painting won't be like a Mona Lisa type of masterpiece, right? It's not going to be something that is very intric intricate or sophisticated, you know, it's going to be very basic, very simple paintings. In hindsight, you might be even think of them a bit, you know, awkward and, and uh, cringeworthy. But that's something that to be expected, you know, when you're learning something that your first stuff and it's not going to be in the most complex and, and sophisticated stuff. You're still learning the tools of the trade. That's part of the process. So obviously I'm not asking you to make a bad game on purpose. That's not the point. Uh, I'm asking you to prioritize the finishing because that's how you learn. You learn making games by finishing games. Don't worry too much about if it's fun or not. It's gonna be cool. We're gonna try to make it cool. It's gonna be fine. Okay, so with that in mind, I compiled four criteria um, that lets us kind of like narrow down a little bit uh, of you know what kind of games we should be looking into. First criteria, very first criteria, low scope. So obviously, your first game is going to be inevitably turning into a hot mess at some point. And when that happens, you don't want to be far away from the finishing line. So if you're making a big game, obviously it's very possible that, you know, you something goes wrong and you're like very stuck and you, there's technical issue and you don't know how to solve this. And the game is still a ways out. And that's hugely de demotivating and it might just completely shut down your entire project because it's like, even if I fix this unsurmountable issue, I still have so much more to go. But if you have a huge problem and the game is almost there, you know, then it's going to be very easy for you to motivate yourself to push through that problem to maybe do some janky work around and just get it out of the door, you know. So that's our most biggest concern, how to do something that has low scope, that is not big, not a big game. Uh, second category, second criteria, it's kind of like related to that problem is um, some, we want to avoid uh, hidden rabbit holes, tech rabbit holes. Uh, a tech rabbit hole is kind of like some kind of technical issue that, that the game hinges on 
there's some kind of technology that the game hinges on that you didn't see coming. A perfect example of that are fighting games, which seem very simple on, 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 on the surface. You know, it's just like a bunch of dudes punching each other, not, no problem. But then, you know, in order to pull off of good fighting games, you have to create like this sophisticated animation system. And that's very abstract and, and you know, daunting. And actually, like once you get into the weeds of it, it, you just get lost in it and it will just probably ruin your entire project. So, uh, yeah, we want to avoid those hidden tech rabbit holes. Third uh, criteria is kind of similar to that. <clears throat> it's um, we want to avoid uh, content rabbit holes. And that's kind of related to this problem that I talked in a previous video is and then content happens issue. Uh, what I mean that is there's a lot of genres that are very simple, uh, kind of like platforms for uh, the developers to deliver a lot of content to the players and that content that is very easily digestible uh, for the players that, that can kind of burn away content. A uh, good example of that being uh, point click adventures, right? Um, which are just, like technically very, very uh, primitive, um, but they're kind of like running on there being a lot of content for players. And creating content takes a lot of time and new new de developers underestimate how much time it takes to develop content, how much time it takes to write stuff, how much time it takes to make graphics and come up with puzzles and ideas and so forth. And so, um, yeah, and that's quite often where you get stuck, you run out of, out of steam very quickly when you're making something that is content based and that will also sabotage your game. So yeah, we want to make games that do not hinge on there being a lot of hot content. And the fourth category, uh, and that's kind of like a, <laughs> here I run into a language issue. We want to avoid thankless genres. So <laughs> a bit of a <laughs> problem here. So you know how there is this idea of a thankless job in English? What's the opposite of that? You cannot say thankful job. That doesn't sound right. I guess worthwhile uh, might be a close relative, but not quite what I'm talking about. In German it works. You can make a thankful genre in, in German. What I mean with that is genres where there are no high expectations from your audience that you have to live up to to be even considered, you know. Um, where the audience will nitpick every decision that you make and will, you know, thumb their noses about your game. It's like, nah, I don't know, it's not a real game because it doesn't have blah, 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 and you should blah, 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 blah. You know, that um, we want to pick genres where people just accept the game for what it is or are more likely to accept the game for what it is and kind of like just casually enjoy it. So all in all, very long introduction as always, so, but generally all in all, uh, if we want to pick an analogy from a different domain, um, if this was cooking, if game development was like cooking, we want to find the equivalent of scrambled eggs. So something that has very few ingredients, something that is finished in no time at all, something that has very few ways which can go sideways, like there's not a lot of ways in which you can screw up scrambled eggs. You can screw it up, but not in a lot of different ways. <laughs> there aren't a lot of failure points in scrambled eggs. and. We also want to, like, scrambled eggs are something that nobody will really, like, you know, nitpick. Nobody will like, oh, I don't know, these scrambled eggs, mm, I think you should next time do, like, nobody will do it. It's scrambled eggs. Let's get on with the list. I have five genres prepared for you. Entry number one, one button games. So I'm talking about things like Flappy Bird, Cannibal, that weird dinosaur game in, in Chrome, Doodle Jump. I guess that's two button games, you know, similar stuff. Terms that people often use for this are kind of like also endless runners. Endless runner is a type of one button game, but I, I guess I, don't, I wouldn't consider Flappy Bird an endless runner. I also wouldn't con call it a genre per se. It's not really a genre, it's more of a design constraint. Uh, we're gonna get to that in a second, but yeah. These types of games are really great for your first game. Why? Here are the reasons. So one way in which game designers look at games is in terms of verbs. A verb is something that the player can do in the game. And there's lots of games that have a lot of verbs. Uh, verbs have to be programmed and usually verbs map to like some kind of control, like usually a button in a game does a verb. One button games have just one verb. <laughs> So it's, you just make one verb and then you're done. That's really great. I love it. As a result, it's kind of like very easy to close the game loop, another game design term. And with that, with that uh, I mean, 
uh, it's very easy to program, you know, and then you inch your way, and then suddenly you have like a couple of seconds of gameplay done, and then the game basically is like, okay, these couple of seconds of gameplay, we just repeat this a couple of times, and that's going to be our game. That's the game loop. We close it, and we just repeat the game loop a couple of times, and that's going to be our game. It's very easy to close that game loop because there's not a lot of uh, elements to the game loop. It's just one verb, and then maybe one obstacle, just like flapping, and pipes, and that's it, and then you're done. Uh, another big important thing, and that comes to the, uh, there is no content uh, rabbit holes here. Uh, procedural levels are completely fine in this genre. Um, you can make handcrafted levels if you want to, um, but it's also completely fine to just have like procedural challenges, to just have like an endless stream of pipes coming for Flappy Bird, and they're just going to be at different heights, and that's going to be it. It's fine. Nobody will complain about that. Speaking to that, um, not thankless, they're kind of like low threshold entry games. It's kind of like a pick up and play game. You just like launch it and play a couple of minutes and then you're done and that's gonna be your experience. And so the audience won't have any big expectations on what this game is supposed to be. They are more willing to accept the game for what it is rather than, you know, measuring up to some high impossible standards. And the final aspect, um, there is a wide play field for experiments, for non-critical experiments. So with that, I mean, uh, once you have a basic game running, it's very easy to add additional elements like special effects, particles, or you know more gameplay stuff, or you know some interesting interactions. Um, but the game doesn't hinge on them. Like if those things don't work out, if these are just experiments and they just fail, and then you're just like, ah, I don't know, let's scratch that. It's going to be fine. The game will still be working and running. Uh, I think you, there's a lot of ways in which you can make these games very big, um, but they don't have to be. And that's great. That's, that gives you like a lot of uh, freedom to experiment with. Okay, so why... Um, that's maybe a more interesting uh, question. Why don't people consider one-button games for their first game? Uh, I think this has to do a lot with Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and I don't mean the book. I mean, like, people, these games have been uh, very popular on mobile platforms and kind of, like, very, very prolific in mobile platforms. A lot of people are making these kinds of games. Uh, and so they kind of have been associated with kind of, like, a low-effort cash grab, maybe, uh, or are not considered a real game. And so I think a lot of um, newcomers will not even consider them because they feel like, ah, oh, I'm not one of those developers who, who stoop so low as to make a one-button game. I think there's something to it, but um, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Um, I remember a time before Flappy Bird where these used to be a formidable game design challenge. I remember, you know, game jams that centered around one button games where this was considered to be, you know, like this, oh, this thinking man's, this designer's game design challenge. How can we get around this restriction of one button games? How can we make something with just one button? That's crazy. Just one button. Wow. Uh, and people were very eager to experiment in this space. And I think that's a very healthy way to approach this, this concept. Okay, uh, things to consider, pitfalls, um, difficulties that you should avoid with this genre. Uh, you might have some prejudice against this genre and your audience might have those too. So yeah, people probably won't think of this game as this kind of big crazy, you know, uh, experience and you should be okay with that. You shouldn't expect too much that people play this for 20 hours or so, you know, it's just gonna be a pick up and play kind of game at best. And, and second thing, um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, it's not really a genre per se, it's a design constraint. So um, if you say, I'm gonna make a one button game, that doesn't really tell you a lot about what kind of game you're making. It restricts some things, but it doesn't really spell out, you know, the individual steps. You still have to do a one design step in between there where you sit down and think about exactly what kind of game you make. A Flappy Bird is different from a Temple Run. These are different games and have different considerations. So, uh, yeah, there is, you have to be aware that there is a design step in between there. And final consideration or final things to avoid, don't, don't subvert the constraint. Don't be like, ah, so there was this this experience that we had where <laughs> in one game jam I did with my students, uh, the students, I gave them the, the task to create a one button game and one team decided that they're gonna make an RPG with just one button. You can make any game with one button if you, if you set your mind out to it. So they did 
try to do make a RPG with one, one button. They got as far as making one, you know, Final Fantasy battle with just one button. It had like a menu and the cursor was just switching through and you had to, had to press at the right moment to select the menus. <laughs> it was like this very elaborate menu with spells and, and so forth. It was horrible. It was just a bad RPG. It was just this, you know this game already. It would be so much better if you could just pick the menus that you wanted to pick. And it was just bad. It was a fun experience, for sure, but it wasn't a good game. So don't try to make a big game with uh, and try to shoehorn this into this constraint. Um, work with the constraint, not against it. Finally, this is a Pico 8 channel. So usually I talk about Pico 8 from a Pico 8 perspective, uh, perspective but this video is supposed to apply to a wider audience of people who just make video games in general. So what if you're working in something like Unity 3? It's fine. It's a very universal kind of game that you that you can pull off in any engine. Anyway, moving on. Uh, genre number two. Shmup. Shmups. Shoot 'em up games. STG shooting type games. The younger folks in the audience might not be familiar with what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about old games like uh, Space Invaders, Galaga, 1942, uh, Gradius, R-Type, Dodonpachi, you know, these kinds of games. A game where you have like a little little ship that you can move around, like a spaceship, and then you press a button and pew, 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 it shoots, shoots lasers or, or whatever, and then there's aliens or some bad guys and you shoot the bad guys up and that's how you win the game. To be fair, it's not quite as uncommon, but still I haven't seen as many uh, shooting games made by newcomers as I, I should be seeing. Like these are, this is a very good choice for your first genre. Why? They're kind of like uh, similar to one button games in that there's there, there's more verbs. You have to, you move your ship and you shoot. So there's two things, <laughs> not just one. <laughs> but they're more specific. So like if you say I'm gonna make a shmup, it's very clearly what you do. It's you set your, yourself up in a path. You, I, I want to make a ship. I want to make the ship, ship move around. I want to shoot at things. I want to have things appear. I want to make them explode. You know, there's like, it's very clearly what kind of kind of game you're making. Second reason is all those things that we're making for the shmup are actually very good things to learn in a game, in development environment. These are good things to learn. Um, lessons from shmups were very easily applied to other games, uh, other genres, because we are drawing sprites on the, uh, on the screen, we are spawning objects, like multiple amounts of objects, we're dealing with arrays, we're making things explode, we're using particle effects, animations, sprite animations, and so forth. And there's collision detection, but the collision detection is very simple. So yeah, these things um, develop skills that will easily apply to other games. Uh, there's lots of, again, like with one-button games, there's lot of, lots of potential to make it big. Um, obviously, Space Invaders is a very simple type of game, but there's also very complex shmups out there. Doesn't mean that you have to go there, but if you want to make it a really awesome game, there's also potential to do so. Why don't people consider shmups as their first genre? I think it's a, it's a bit of an old genre, a very basic genre, not necessarily in people's mind. There's not a lot of new shmups coming out. There are maybe some on the Switch, but yeah, it's it's very much um, a genre that is... Uh, uh, that lives in a 2D era of games and we are kind of like way past the 3D era of games now. So kind of like not really something that maybe people are considering. Now, problems that you should be aware of with the genre is um, it's easy to get something going to make a very basic shmup. It's difficult and crazy difficult to make a very good shmup. Uh, there's like a game design wall happening where it's easy to, to get up something running, but it's very difficult to get something really good that will satisfy the connoisseurs of the genre, you know? At the same time, like connoisseurs of the genre are very difficult to please, so this is kind of like those uh, unthankful genre problems. So uh, I think you should just pick a realistic goal, um, like making a Space Invader clones or... or uh, Galaga clone is fine, uh, but you're not gonna make, you know, the next dot on Pachi, probably not as of your first game. Um, I would generally aim for a procedural-ish kind of um, level. Um, I would avoid bosses. This is a typical tech rabbit hole, something that people get lost on. What if I am working in Unity and not in Pico 8? That's fine. Um, shmups work in every engine. Uh, if you're working in Unity, <clears throat> I would recommend uh, working with 2D sprites, not uh, trying to make it in 3D. Um, there is it's just so much easier to produce the content of sprites in 2D than have to create like craft uh, 3D stuff. Moving on, third genre that I would recommend: falling block 
puzzles. Tetris, Bejeweled, Dr. Mario, Puyo Puyo, you know, these kinds of games. Why are those games great as your first genre? They are a perfect example of the not thankless category. People love those games. It's kind of weird because it's not necessarily a genre that you see like fans seeking out. There's not a, like a big falling block puzzle community. It's just like a very wide appeal. Like people are like, oh, it's like Tetris and they're just gonna play the game, you know. Uh, there is not a lot of things that can go wrong here. It's kind of like the Scrabble X things like you need blocks and they need to be falling and then something cool will happen hopefully and, and people will be fine with that. Another thing is they have really low artwork requirements. So this is really good if you are kind of like insecure about your artwork. You know, if you maybe don't have an artist, if you never good, were good at pixel art, this is great. There's not a lot of um, pixel art involved. It doesn't mean that effects are irrelevant. And if you are a good pixel artist, you can definitely make an even better game. But it doesn't, the game doesn't hinge on that, you know. Another big important thing, and that's unique for this genre compared to the other ones, or I guess there's one more other that we're gonna talk about that has this as well, which is they can be designed on paper. You can design the games on paper before even writing your first code. So with a lot of games, you have to kind of design them while programming, or you have there's things you have to figure out while you program them because they rely on uh, like some kind of live interaction that cannot be prototyped on, on, on paper. You have to like make it happen, make it happen on the screen to see if it works. Uh, with the falling block puzzle games, at least the mechanics can be prototyped on paper or with like Lego bricks or like with some kind of token, you know, with like bottle caps or something. You can just see if this works before you have to program this. And this is really great because like switching between the game designer and the programmer stuff can get really confusing because you don't know what you want to program because you haven't designed it yet. But designing it is difficult because you the programming is difficult. So you kind of like get into the like an chicken and egg problem. Uh, so being able to get around that problem by just deciding what the game is first on paper and then just doing it, it's great. It's perfect. That's something I did on My Chance Sweet Buns and it was just so liberating. Just, you know, exactly what you're going to do. A little pro argument. There's a lot of obscure falling block puzzle games that are that you can clone. Uh, Back in the days, Tetris was a huge breakaway success and there was a lot of people who tried to copy Tetris. And so there's a lot of games that you can just just remake and it's fine. I, I have I have a grudge against Yoshi. I've seen this game coming out. I had no idea what this game was because there was no reviews and previews back then. I just saw the package and I was like, yes, the game about Yoshi. I'm into Yoshi. Yes, you're going to be like jump around about Yoshi. And it was just a falling block game. I was like furious. Like, what is this? It's probably a great game. Anyway, a final reason why these games are great is they are a procedural and immersion by nature. Um, uh, procedural means that we are avoiding content um, rabbit holes. So it means like if you have the rules down, you just randomly spawn blocks or randomly sp spawn stuff and uh, they will generate content automatically without you having to make the levels. And um, they do so, uh, they are emergent. So that means that you know, Tetris is constantly creating puzzles for the player. Like there's constantly things that they have to figure out. But you as a game designer, you haven't created those puzzles. The puzzles kind of create themselves. And that's super satisfying as a game developer because it's like, hey, you just made a couple of rules and there's all this complexity emerging from those rules. That's good. If you can make that work, it's incredibly satisfying. Reasons why people don't consider these types of games. Um, Again, not a really uh, like. There's not really like, a dedicated fan community to those games. Like, there's it's, there's a lot of goodwill in general populations. Like, everybody knows Tetris, so if you see this kind of games, you know what you're talking about. You're like, yeah, yeah, Tetris. I like Tetris. Let, let me give it a try. Uh, but not necessarily like a laser focused community uh, celebrating those games. So not necessarily maybe something that's in your mind. When is the last time that you bought a triple A falling block <laughs> type of game? <laughs> it's been a while. Another reason might be that they are very like rules and gameplay driven and that might seem daunting. There's like not a lot of like story or anything about them. It's just like really just raw gameplay. And again, this might seem uh, very technical and very daunting, but you sh it's they're much easier than you think. It's like it's very easy to get some rules together that suddenly work. Potential problems to avoid here are um, 
Um, there are some rules to those games, and you have to teach those rules to the player, and uh, you have to be aware of this. This might be you might have to do some kind of manual or tutorial, and um, because th how those games work might not be uh, obvious at first glance. One way to um, test for this problem is to play test. So you have to keep in mind schedule a play test round where you will show this game to players and you watch how the people you know deal with playing the game what kind of problems they, they encounter and then you still have to schedule some work after the playtest so you can respond to the results of the playtest maybe you have to introduce a tutorial or change something around or maybe add some text box somewhere that takes time and you have to schedule ahead a little bit for that uh, finally uh, like one last tip don't overthink it it's fine to make a Tetris clone. People won't mind about the Tetris clone with a different skin. It's fine. Really, just do it. It's it's okay. Uh, what if I'm working in Unity 3D? Um, yeah, this might not be good for Unity. The, the first genre that we have here that might not be good for Unity. Um, these games um, rely on tiles, on a tile grid. And Unity doesn't have that from scratch. There is a tile grid system that you can use from that is built into Unity, but you have to you know get it out and understand how it works, and that will require you to do some legwork. There is also additional tile grid system you can get from the um, from the store, and all of this is just additional legwork that you have to do before you can make the game. And so, if you're working Unity, you might look into other genres. Genre number four. I'm cheating here a little bit. So these um, these labyrinth puzzle games, I call this. So it's a different type of puzzle game, basically. But eh, there's a lot of puzzles, okay? So I'm talking about games like Sokoban. It's probably the biggest and well-known entry in this genre. Labyrinth is not really an, a term I invented. It's not There's not really a name for this, but Sokoban clones, usually people say. Uh, there's also Boxel. Chips Challenge is a really good one. Uh, Snoopy's Magic Show on a Game Boy, I remember. Quirk, you know. So yeah, these are games where you have like labyrinths. It's usually not scrolling, but you can make it scrolling as well. Um, and then you have like a character moving in this labyrinth and there's some blocks they can interact with in interesting ways. And then the goal is to get from the en entrance to the exit and then there's going to be a couple of levels. I'm breaking one of my, our rules. This is content driven. So these games usually have, um, uh, you know, the developer creates levels that you have to get through. Uh, but I'm making an exception here because I think for these games, creating levels is not that difficult. It doesn't It's not as quite time consuming. And there's uh, great upsides to, to picking the genre. What are the upsides? Why, are, why is it so great to pick the genre? A lot of people come into game development because they want to make games that they really love. They play me played as a, as a younger person that they grew up with. And a lot of those games are RPGs, um, you know, Zelda, action RPGs, you know, kind of these types of games where you have like a character that is moving through a dungeon. You see them from the top and they slashes enemies and kills them or whatever. Uh, this genre, the Sokoban genre, is not that. But it's very close. So it can scratch that itch without having to go into full-blown action RPG thing, which has a lot of pitfalls and you should avoid it. Um, so if you want to go there, if that's what your driving motivation is, so it's a good game to pick as a, as a stepping stone, as a practice, to get eventually later on to a follow-up to a sequel that will be more, more elaborate. Uh, like with the falling block puzzle games, they can be prototyped on paper, So and I would definitely recommend you to do that. So again, you can sit down on a piece of paper and draw out your first, second, third level and figure out what the mechanics are and see if you can solve the level and maybe even give it to another person and see, hey, if you had like these kind of like rules, like you can build, you know, using miniatures or bottle caps, you can build the level and see if another person will be able to solve it. Um, that's great. So being able to figure out what you're making before you make it is, is a huge boon. And again, I think they are really good if you're working in a team because there's a lot of um, tasks that are independent of each other that can be delegated. So one person could be working on the graphics, another person is doing the programming, a third person making the levels. Um, and because you can start out uh, on paper, this is a easy way to you know, collaborate and come up with the rules before you go on making a game. I think if you're working in a team, that would be a really good game to pick. A uh, reason why people don't pick um, this genre as their first game is, uh, I think, again, there is a really strong draw to make uh, an action RPG and people are just get impatient and they just jump straight to the chase and just make it their big action RPG, just, just make, try to make Zelda and don't even think that there might be something simpler uh, on their way there. 
Um, also, the genre kind of doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it kind of dissolved. Uh, and it's now kind of part of the action RPG genre. Um, things to consider, things to avoid. So I would be careful about uh, real-time elements. These games can have real-time elements. Um, <laughs> Snoopy, the, the Snoopy game on Game Boy, I remember, had real-time elements. Um, and so, for example, also like po um, Pac-Man could be considered as kind of like part of the genre, but it's kind of like not really about puzzle solving. Pac-Man is more about uh, the action part. I would avoid the action part, uh, make it more of a puzzle game. Um, I would also avoid, definitely avoid enemies that follow you all around. It seems like an obvious thing to do in a labyrinth to have like an enemy that stalks you. Don't do that. It's, it's a tech rabbit hole to make the pathfinding work. Just avoid it. Just don't do it. It's just try to focus on um, some kind of tiles, interesting tiles to interact with, and some interesting elements. And maybe some you know p things that are moving back and forth. You don't, doesn't mean that you can't have enemies, but they should be maybe working in a more predictable fashion and not trying to like seek you out. As I said, um, this is a game that relies on you making levels. Mm, so uh, you want to make sure that you kind of define uh, what your scope is, how many levels you want to make, uh, figure out how much time you want people to spend with the game before you do it. Um, maybe even try one of those games yourself. I listed a couple of games you should maybe try out. Um, you want to be... Uh, you want to err on the lower side. You want to leave people hungry for more rather than overstay your welcome. Remember, we want to get done. That's our biggest goal. There will be a strong drive to add story to, to, to this type of game. Don't do it or do it at last. Do it as the last thing you're going to do and not don't start with the story. Just like make sure the game works without the story. And then if, if that's, everything is working and the game is playable and you still have some time left, you can add the story. What if I'm working with Unity? Um, don't. It's... Again, it's one of the games that depends on there being a tile grid. And if you don't have a tile grid, then it's going to be very difficult to make this work. And it's going to be work lots of awkward workarounds. And uh, you have to understand Unity's tile grid systems in order to for this to make it work. So you'll either be okay with that or you just pick another genre. Final game, number five. This one is uh, comes out of left field. I, um, racing games. Haven't seen a lot of those. Um, yeah, so what I'm talking about is, it's kind of, it might be difficult to figure out what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Gran Turismo, okay? <laughs> uh, what I'm talking about is uh, top-down racing games like Micro Machines, and maybe even not scrolling racing games like Super Off-Road, um, Super RC Pro-AM, you know, like this kind of stuff. Or uh, I think um, on the NES there was a very old one called Road Fighter. Uh, Grand Prix on an Atari 2600. Yeah, so very simple 2D racing games. Why I think it, this might be a good genre to pick, um, I'm not sure about this, by the way. I haven't actually made those games before, but I haven't seen them, a lot of them out there either. So, hmm. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's great, it's a very flexible genre. It's so flexible, it's like chewing gum of a genre. And you can comfortably pick a type of racing game that works for you, that you can put off. Like you have a skill set or maybe you have no skills at all. You can easily pick something that is in your wheelhouse um, because there's different ways of making racing games. And I think a lot of people are not aware of this and this is why people don't consider it. I think these days racing games are firmly embedded into this 3D idea of that, you know, you have a 3D world, 3D simulation, physics simulation, and you have a car in 3D. Back before we had 3D, we had to be really creative or we had to get like, create different types of racing games that were in 3D. And those were really great games. They were really great racing games. And I think it's really easy to take, uh, to look at the pool of the 2D racing games out there and just pick something that is that will work for you. It's also flexible in a, not just in a term of technical solutions, but also in terms of um, settings. There's like a lot of things that you can race with, right? There, it's just, it, it can be cars, but there's so many different cars. Rally, you know, Formula One, NASCAR, uh, really, when you talk about realistic cars, carts, like um, go-karts can work too. Like there's a lot of kart racing games, obviously. Um, or it can be like a boat. Or it can be like a plane, or it can be just rockets. It can be spaceships. You know, there's just so many things that you can race. It's crazy. You, you can race chocobos and like dragons or whatever. It's 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 just like 
it's so wide open in the, in the settings and it's so easy to pick something that maybe nobody ever considered. Like, what about sentient cheese racing game? Write that down, write that down! <laughs> Another reason why it's great is when we get down to it, what it actually is that we're talking about is we have an avatar, something that we're controlling, and we can move it around. And usually a lot of games are, okay, now I have to think I'm moving around, now I, the game development begins. No, you know, now I have to figure out you know, what I can interact with, what my other verbs are. But here in racing games, you have an avatar and you can move it around, you're done. <laughs> That's it. You just have a thing, a car that you can drive around. And then you can just drive around in circles and that's it that's the game you're basically finished so it's kind of like going back to the first genre like it's a it's a, genre, it's a genre with very few verbs the verbs that you have like the things that you have to do like a heavy sprite that moves around on the screen are things that easily carry over into other genres um repetitive gameplay is fully accepted it's completely fine to have one level and you have to make three laps of it. That's normal, that's, that's, how, that's how a racing game works, that's good. And finally, again, it's going to that not thankless thing. It's, it's a thoroughly not thankless genre. It's widely accessible. People just understand racing on a, fu a fundamental level. I think uh, there was a statistic that the racing genre is secretly one of the most popular genres, uh, just because of like stuff like Mario Kart. Like Everybody can pick up a controller and start moving a, a, a thing on the screen and it's so immediately fun and enjoyable to go fast and and go around the track and avoid obstacles it's, so, it's just so clear what you're doing there it's just good a reason why people d <laughs> i'm not sure why people don't think of racing games when when they're picked a genre i think one of the reasons might be something i already discussed i think this genre is so firmly rooted in 3d now uh, and a simulation 3D, you know, Gran Turismo and Forza and whatever, that people all just like forget that you can do so much more and that this genre used not to be 3D and you could do also a 2D racing game. Like just people just don't consider it. It's just like a completely blind spot. Potential problems with the genre. If you're not working in a 3D engine, don't do 3D, period. There is uh, good tutorials on how to make pseudo 3D or 3D games in Pico 8. Don't do those tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> not as your first game, like as your second game, third, so forth. You can be, you can, it can be fine, but um, and these kind of like fake three kind of things, they don't, they are very complicated. You, they are technical rabbit holes, uh, and the skills you learn there are not necessarily skills that will skills that will carry over to the other genres. So just don't do it. Uh, also, the AI um, is a rabbit hole, uh, is a technical rabbit hole. So just make. No, like, just don't do the AI. <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> it's fine to make a game that's just a time trial, that is just like, you have to go around the track in a certain amount of time. It's fine. And I think that's a good first step to aim at. And if you're, if that's working, if that's a fun game, and if you still have time left, you have can try to figure out the AI, but um, don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, collision can be difficult with those games. So because... Um, yeah, usually you expect some kind of like physical interaction, you collide with a barrier and you bounce back and it's very easy to make collision detection where you get stuck in a barrier and you cannot get out anymore. Um, so consider just like exploding on impact. It's fine. You just make it, make yourself, like set yourself up for success here. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to make it more complicated than it has to be. Um, yeah, one thing to avoid, don't do multiplayer unless it's a physical game jam. Unless you are at a venue with other people, and at the end there's going to be, you know, everybody will play, we'll be playing the games together. Uh, if you're at a venue, then that's fine, because then obviously you will have an audience there and people will be able to enjoy it together. But releasing a multiplayer game online is just a recipe to for the game to be never played by anybody, because nobody, especially now in a pandemic, nobody has a person they can play it with. It's, it's just like, it's just like such a thankless thing to do. What about Unity? What about if I'm working in Unity? Um, that's great. That's actually a really good framework to be making racing games in. So yeah, it's actually a lot of easier to make a racing game in Unity than to make it in Pico 8. Uh, that's because in Unity you can go 3D, so you can make your, you know, uh, Mario Kart or whatever. 
Uh, and also Unity comes with all the you know physical collision detections and so forth, so it's very easy to set up a racing track. It's actually probably the genre to pick when you're working in a 3D engine like Unity. Uh, it can still work very well in Pico 8, but um, yeah, in Unity is probably even easier. All right, so that's it. That's my five genres to summarize a one-button game, something like um, Flaggy Bird or uh, Doodle Jump. Second one is Shmups, shooting up games. Ship shoots at things. Good. A third one is uh, falling block type games. Just make Tetris. It's fine. Um, fourth one is a labyrinth game, labyrinth puzzle games, Sokoban, Chips Challenge, that kind of stuff. And the last one is racing games. Uh, focus on 2D. Unless you're working a 3D engine, then you can make it 3D. So these are my five genres five overlooked genres. There's obviously other things you can try out. And if you have any suggestions yourself, if you there's a genre that you think people should do, post in the comment section. And if you're thinking of platformers right now, maybe you should watch my other video first where I talk about the genres that maybe you shouldn't pick as your first genre. <laughs> platformers are not a good idea, I think. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think in the comment section down there. Uh, let me know what you think of this new layout here. I'm trying something new, maybe it doesn't work, you let me know. So yeah, today more of a theoretical video. Um, I'm still working on the big shmup tutorial. That's something that is coming up next. Uh, there's some progress pics that I always post in Discord. So if you want to know how things are going, uh, you can join our Discord down in the doobly-doo. There is a link there. Uh, yeah, I will be trying to crank out a video at least once per month now. That's some of the goal that's set out to me. And you can call me out on this if it doesn't work out. That's, uh, that's fine. Okay, so see you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.